when you're first starting out, nobody knows who you are. Even if you have an agent, they don't bring you in that often. And I wanted to be able to pay for casting workshops because you have to get yourself in the room. Mm. Um, so I worked for Pete's Coffee and Tea and used it as a meet people, study people from all walks of life job, which, and then uh, something to do so you don't get bored or sad waiting for the phone to ring. Hey, 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 you're listening to Inside Acting, a podcast dedicated to demystifying the inner and outer game of success in the entertainment industry. I'm Trevor Elgott. And I'm AJ Meyer. And in episode 285, we bring you part one of my interview with actor, theater producer, and soon-to-be Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, that's right, Terry Reeves. Now, Terry was brought to you by our friend and former director of PR, Jasmine Bristow, so she actually joined me on this interview. In part one, Terry discusses her college acting experience, how her graduate school showcase led her to landing in Los Angeles, one of the best thrival jobs we have ever heard on the podcast, her early bookings, and her quote-unquote other life as a personal trainer. That and more coming up in episode 285. Support for this episode of Inside Acting is brought to you in part by Rehearsal Pro, the current version of Rehearsal. I love this app. It's the essential app for actors. It's available right now in the iTunes App Store for your iOS device. If you want to learn your lines, if you want to be off book for your auditions, if you want to walk into that room, having explored your character, made really strong choices, and knowing you're going to book the office, go to rehearsal.pro slash IAP right now to learn all about this kick-ass app and download it for yourself. That's rehearsal.pro slash IAP. <laughs> Trev, you sound so far away. Doesn't anyone use Skype anymore? You're so far away. Where, where, where did you move out, man? Are you living in a can? What's happening? Not yet, not yet, no. But well, you know, it's a lot of transition and change in my life recently, and uh, one of those things had to do with my living situation. And so there's some bills that need to be renegotiated and transferred and canceled and started again. And internet was one of them. So um, I've been without internet at my home for uh, the past like week and a half, two weeks, and it's, I haven't really been in a huge rush to get it again because it's kind of nice. To be completely honest. <laughs> I was just going to say, what's it like back there in the 90s? Um, <laughs> are the 90s as good as people said they were? Um, so so what do you, because so much of uh, the our, our sort of millennial jobscape uh, occurs uh, online. So, so what are you, what are you doing to sort of compensate or are you just putting down that kind of work while you're home and then picking it up again when you're like at work, for instance. Yeah, exactly. My, the apartment, uh, has been a sort of, I don't know, like, I don't know what word I'm looking for here. Like, but like sanctuary unplugged cocoon. Yeah. Like a sanctuary. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just been really nice. I come home and it's like, I can be on my phone if I want to, but, um, for the most part, I've just been enjoying like shutting down, keeping my laptop closed and just, reading or walk, you know, going for walks or going out to hang with friends or whatever, you know, just, just being, it's been, it's been really nice. And I, I am realizing how much of my life was sort of sucked up by just like information on the internet, constantly wanting to feel connected to the world, to the stream of, of stuff out there. And so closing it off and not having the option really to dig in beyond this little tiny screen on my phone has been it's really nice. What is this no internet you speak of? <laughs> well, I'll talk about this this next episode too. But uh, I just finished reading Homo Dei, which I know you and I have, have talked about, and I finally finished it. It's, it's kind of a big, dense book, but it really, man, did it bake my freaking noodle. I'm still sort of digesting everything, and the last couple chapters are all about 
how the internet of all things is what he calls it. It's sort of the next level of human evolution. Uh, and that that's really going to become the next life form and that human beings are going to be relegated to just taking their advice from algorithms everywhere they go, because the algorithms that humans create will eventually know us better than we know ourselves. Mm. And we'll turn to them to make all the difficult decisions in our lives. Mm. And uh, he talks about, you know, how we're sort of starting down the path of nothing having any meaning if it's not recorded and shared in some way. And so that that, that kind of like shook me up. And then I was like, thank God I don't have internet right now. <laughs> I'm getting back in touch with what it's like to be a human being, an organic you know, creature in an organic world. Are you sure, uh, though? Not because having to share everything. Do you exist when you don't post on Instagram? Because I don't. I think you may be fading into oblivion, Trevor. It's like those. It, it's, it's like those photos on uh, Back to the Future. I think. I think you're actually it, fading. It, it into really. It, it kind of feels like that, man. It it kind of does. Like I, I've been. Not I was joking, but geez. No, but it, but seriously, I mean, think about it. If you're not active on the internet, you're basically invisible these days. You basically don't exist, and so it's been weird to sort of bring my reality back into this present moment thing that most of the time only I get to experience and I don't have to look to others for validation and you know how many likes I got on a photo or something and and it's it's been a, it's been a trip man and man it, this is a podcast about acting so we need to go down that road but uh, it's been it's been nice and scary and refreshing and uh, full of epiphanies little epiphanies you exist to me, Trevor. You will always exist to me. <clears throat> and our listeners, I'm sure they they they're, they're wondering. They're like, is he okay? Like, <laughs> he's in a he's in a hole. Yes, everyone. If you don't post on 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 Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter, I promise you, it is okay. <laughs> Trevor is okay. Mm. You are okay. We are all okay. Um, well, that's cool. What an unexpected gift. Yeah, yeah. It's been it's been nice. Uh, how about you, man? Uh, I see on the outline here something we talked about the other night, which is that uh, you were on a veil. Past tense. Yeah, yeah. The actor's two most dreaded words uh, on a veil. Um, I I spoke about the fact that I got new commercial representation here in Los Angeles a few episodes ago, and so far I have only gone out on two auditions. And on my second one, I got a call back a week later, and then I got put on a veil a day later, and then I got released about an hour or two later after that. Mm. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I did, I, you know, uh, I was talking to Ben and, and, and of course, Jasmine, and, 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 and I already sort of knew that it was a celebration because this is only my second audition with these new agents, and they're probably excited, and you know, booking would have been nice, but I've done, as Ben said, I did, I did my job. Like the fact that I got put on a veil meant that I was, I did my job well enough that I absolutely could have booked it. The only thing that, that was between me and a booking is a contract and money, you know? So, um, that, that definitely felt good, but I would be lying if I didn't say that there were, you know, a couple of tears shed, um, after just allowing it to breathe in and and sink in a bit, um, you know, about eh, I'd say an hour or two after I got the news that I had been released, I I I just I needed a minute, um, yeah, mm, just to yeah. kind of sit and breathe and let the emotions sort of wash over me and and then and then move on. So um, yeah. when I was when I was going out commercially, my I you know I didn't book. I don't think I booked. I think I might have booked one commercial. I can't even remember because it's been so many years. But you know, I was I would get called back a lot. My callback rate was probably about eighty percent. But I wow. never I wasn't really booking, and I was feeling really bummed about it. And um, I was having a conversation with my commercial agent one day, and and she said, "If you're getting called back, you're doing your job. Like yeah. that that shows us that they like you, they want you in the room, they want to work with you. They're just once you get called back, you basically booked it. It's just up to somebody else to make a decision based on." infinite number of factors that you have no knowledge of nor control over right so so let that be a lesson to all ye listening right now. <laughs> if you're getting called back you're doing your job yeah absolutely absolutely i mean it's always a good reminder um but you know it was just i i haven't been that close in a long time 
and uh, I don't think yeah. I've ever been. I don't. I've. You know what? I think I. I have never been on a veil for a commercial. Um. So that that was even that was a sort of a new, um, experience. I'd never been on a veil for a commercial. I had only gotten like a couple of callbacks back in the day when I had a commercial agent. I mean, I certainly didn't have an eighty percent callback rate. I probably had a ninety-five percent not callback rate. Uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, so, so that was a new experience. And, and like I said, I did my job and it was only the second time I gone out. So I'm batting 500 right now and I'm, I'm stoked about that. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So the work is paying off. The hair is paying off. (laughs) The hair is paying (laughs) off. Yes. The hair. Well, you've got such a unique look right now. It's, it's, I'm, and I can't imagine it's not working for you because people like you're that much more specific. Yeah, the role the role in the commercial was a was a gladiator. So there is that. Oh, badass! Badass. <laughs> yeah, it, cool. it would have been it would have been a really cool day on set or a couple days on set. But I don't want to get too deep into our episode here without acknowledging uh, and welcoming a couple of new members into the membership: Derek Cook and forgive me if I mess this up, but Han May Pak. Um, two new members we just uh, uh, welcomed on board this week. Uh, congratulations and welcome to the the membership. And uh, don't know about too much going on uh, highlight wise, other than I'm assuming we're not quite finished with the prosperous heart. Is that correct? No, I think we got about two more weeks. All right, two so more weeks. On getting that. close, yeah. closing in, and. Um, our working Wednesday uh, uh, Twitter hashtag is 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 growing uh, every week. I'm seeing more and more photos and posts being posted, and that's always fun. So check us out if you're listening to this uh, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Uh, go ahead and uh, hashtag working Wednesday and 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 um, send a message uh, or a at reply rather to uh, to the podcast. Unless you don't have internet, and then you know. You aren't listening to this, first of all, (laughs) and second of all, you don't exist, so it's fine. Support for this episode of Inside Acting is also brought to you in part by VO2GoGo.com, the award-winning voiceover training system and winner of Backstage's Reader's Choice Award for Best VO Training four years in a row. Visit VO2GoGo.com slash start for a free getting started in voiceover online class that'll help you add voiceover to your acting portfolio. And if you sign up, you may actually end up with our very own Trevor Algat as a teacher one day. That's VO, the number two, gogo.com slash start. Awesome. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying the new format. I, we talked about this many, many episodes ago, but this year we were doing something with VO to Gogo called Flipping the Classroom where basically everybody watches the stuff online. David's recorded these really fantastic videos for each module. There are 36 modules for the year, and each one is broken up into three different parts. And so you watch them online beforehand, and then you can choose to go to a live workout in, oh man, there's like four or five locations now, one of them being Hollywood, which is the one that I lead, uh, or you can do it online. And it's really fun, man, when people come in and, and we, 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 we sort of rehash what we learned uh, that month uh, via the videos on our own. And then we hop on the mic and we do a workout, essentially. And we have a really good time just playing with the different spots that are available and getting really good on the mic. It's, it's been a good time. I just did the last one this past Sunday and it was, it was awesome. So uh, if anybody's thinking about Vito Go Go or you're all a member and you haven't come to the Hollywood workouts yet, come on by. We have a good time and on the it's usually the last Sunday of the month at Actors Comedy Studio. And uh, I really enjoy it. So hope to see uh to see you there if you if you think that'd be for you. <laughs> awesome. That's really that's really cool. I, I I definitely more than anything I wanna um I've always wanted to experience you teaching these classes. I, I think I would sign up for that uh, even before I would sign up for the uh, the training, and the training would just be a bonus. <clears throat> that's, that's that's kind of you to that's say. Some, that's some bromance for you there. <laughs> a little bromance for my bro there. The bromance persists. Nevertheless, the bromance persists. <laughs> I think uh, Shakespeare wrote that, right? <laughs> that's a Shakespeare line? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any uh, uh, listener questions or voicemails this week. Is that true? 
I think that is true. I think oh. we've got uh, nothing in the queue. So if you have a question that's been burning in your mind that you'd like to ask us, or at least just something to discuss on the air, send it our way. Uh, inside acting podcast at gmail.com or support at inside acting.net. Um, and there's a million ways you can, you can send us a question. Yeah. I was going to say the, we the voicemail uh, line. got the voicemail yeah. line and the speak pipe thing on the website. You can just record right through the website these days. So, uh, yeah. if you exist, meaning you have the internet, <laughs> here I go again. <laughs> You're just going to keep hammering that one, huh? You get a lot of mileage out of that. <laughs> uh, I know. I mean, my, well, hang on. Mileage is generous. Mileage assumes that it actually is like humorous and landing with people. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Nevertheless, the bromance persists. Well, if we have nothing else to do than to be cheesy, why don't we move into uh, this uh, this interview with uh, with Terry? I am super stoked to to hear this. I was bummed that I couldn't uh, join you for it, but Terry sounds like somebody that I would really vibe with. So I'm really excited to, to give this a listen. Yeah, she, as you'll hear, she uh, she she has a, a sort of a side gig, what she calls her other life as a personal trainer. So um, your, your name was definitely mentioned. I may have edited that part out for time, but, uh, but you would definitely vibe with her. We vibed with her. Uh, she was a fantastic guest. I'm actually really excited to bring her back on because she had to... Um, she had to scoot because she had a client and we didn't get to some of the stuff that I wanted to talk to her about, but you'll hear all that probably in part two next week. Um, but, uh, enjoy this interview guys. It's a, it's a really awesome, pragmatic, practical, uh, approach. And, um, we really enjoyed having Terry on. So, uh, enjoy and we'll catch you on the other side. Hey guys, this is AJ, and I am joined by two powerhouse ladies today. I'm really excited about this. We have our guest, Terry Reeves, who was brought to us by Jasmine Bristow, so uh, I invited her on to, uh, to help us uh, interview. Hello, Jasmine. Hello. And um, I, just, I just spoiled it. Well, it's been spoiled by the bookends of the podcast already, but um, we have um, someone <laughs> we're very excited to be interviewing today. Um, she is an actor, and uh, do you consider yourself a stunt woman? Can I say stunt woman? As well, I mean that's awesome. Please put that in my introduction. <laughs> in your bio, it's not technically in your bio, but not I would say because uh, of all the training that you do, you, you're doing a lot of your own stunts. And I was thinking too, the last time Jasmine, you helped uh, me uh-huh. interview somebody, it was a an uh, a female actor uh, stunt person. Yes. So uh, that's kind of a weird um, streak that you have going on. But you're welcome. <laughs> Strong um, females. That's a great streak. And yes, I, I need to be careful because stunt women are incredible women and I'm not quite in their category. They let me do stunts <laughs> when the insurance will cover any mistakes I make. So ah, <laughs> those, yes. those women are the real heroes. <laughs> yeah. And they're caveat. Yeah. Right. And there, yeah. there's so many, um, you know, we're all on the same team, but there's so many rules when it comes to that kind of thing for safety. Totally. And like you said, insurance and that kind of thing. But anyway, Terry Reeves, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, I'm excited to talk with you guys. Thanks for having me. So uh, I was able to, there's a lot of, there's quite a bit uh, of stuff um, available uh, about you and your story online. Oh. Um, but I like hearing about it from, you know, the guests themselves. So it, it, you were originally born in uh, Northern California, but it looks like you moved around a lot. I did. I did indeed. I was born in Northern California. My dad was in a really volatile uh, job. It was uh, retail, not military, which everybody assumes. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it's volatile. So he, lo- you know, you would lose jobs or companies would go under. So every time he had to move, we moved with him. So we ended up in Texas for a while, Michigan, LA, and then back and forth, mostly in California from Northern to Southern. Uh, so I, I got good at adapting to new environments and meeting new people, which has become one of my favorite things. Uh, it's, I was thinking, what's the, uh, what's the retail equivalent of army brat Sale, sales, yeah. sales, brat, your sales, brat. Re- we'll do brat. that. You retail brat. brat. <laughs> retail brat. <laughs> so, but it looks like you didn't really like, uh, catch the bug as it were until college. I mean, I played the ladybug in James and the Giant Peach in elementary school. So that was your breakout role? That was my breakout role. Yes. 
And then I did drama class in high school. Oh, you did? Okay. I did, yeah, yeah. And then I went to college, and I said to my mom and dad, I mean, I auditioned for all the acting schools and didn't get into any of them, which mm. was a blessing. Mm. So I'm like, well, crap, this is this is harder than it looks. So I'm going to go to college, get a real degree, real, in quotes, degree. Yes. So I go to UCSB, but, but it turns out they have a BFA program that starts in your sophomore year. And so then I was like, well, I'll audition one last time, and if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And that's the program I get into, wow. and it's a you know it's a conservatory, so it's serious. So I took math classes on the side just to keep my uh, that part of my brain going. But mm-hmm. then I you know from then on I, I was like, oh yep, I'm an actress. That's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna go for. I'm kind of jealous because I I really wanted to. Jasmine knows this about me, but I I really wanted to be a math minor at UCLA. Yeah. And nerd. I yeah nerd, you're a nerd. <laughs> um, don't call me a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> this is my show. Um, uh, yeah, but the, UCLA has such a intense conservatory like program that they they really strongly discourage people yeah. from, from doubling up uh, in any way, and it's it's nearly impossible anyway, considering how much um, class you live you're taking there. and stuff you like that. Yeah, your exactly. Pajamas in theater <laughs> yes. class, right? Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. So <clears throat> you got into the program at UCSB. And mm-hmm. um, w- what was that experience like in terms of being in a, I mean, drama class in high school is one thing, but then an actual yeah. training program at a university is a completely different thing. What what was that experience like for you just being in a, a sort of more, I don't want to call it regimented, but a more academic, academic mm-hmm. or well, it's focused. formal, focused, yeah. formal, yeah, mm-hmm. focused, there you go, uh, uh, time in your life. I mean, your world gets rocked because... Being a real artist, a true artist, a dedicated artist, takes all of you. Mm-hmm. It takes your body, your mind, your soul, your your dreams. Like you're investing your entire self, right? In high school, you, you've got you know different classes during different hours of the day, so you're just kind of meddling and playing, toying with little things. But when you really focus on and you go to an academy like you did or I did, um, it becomes what you eat and breathe. Mm. Uh, so even in math class, I'm watching how the teacher moves to see like her mannerisms <laughs> and how they're indicating, you know, what she's feeling at the moment as she's doing the calculus equation on the board. Uh, so, uh, and it's it's a beautiful thing, and it's a and it's an exhausting thing. You also, I love being in the conservatory because um, it, was, it was small, so you get really close to everybody. You become this crazy messed up family, uh, and uh, you know each other's business in this really interesting sort of creative way and so collaboration and working with other people uh becomes something that you crave and learn to to love so that was my experience yeah i'm excited that reminds me uh, i mean we're not quite there yet but i am very excited to talk to you about your involvement in the um the la theater scene as well um because i've spent a lot of a lot of time there but you know you're talking about collaboration and that's what that's all about um so you got your bfa from UC Santa Barbara, and then you ended yeah. up c- continuing on, right? And got your MFA I, as well. I did. Another one of those, I don't know if I'm ready for the real world yet. Like, <laughs> let's be honest. Let's be honest with myself mm-hmm. and where I'm at. Um, so I'm going to audition for all the graduate school conservatories. And if I get in, then it's meant to be. If not, then I'll figure my stuff out, my shit out. So I didn't get into the ones I wanted to. Um, I did get into a couple that were awesome. And then on a whim, I was like, ah, fuck it, I'll do one more. And UCSD was just like, you know, I was there auditioning for all the other ones. And UCSD was this little one in the down the hallway in this little <laughs> corner. I'm like, I don't even know who they are. And I'm like, I'll pop in. So I get into UCSD, UC San Diego, and I had no idea how fantastic it was. So I yeah, I've visit heard the great other... things about their, their program there. It's, it's incredible. I just was living in my little bubble, as hmm. people do. Um, so I went to visit all the schools that I got into, and UCSD was I- exceptional. And we do our showcase with NYU and Yale, so I should have known. I just wow. didn't. Um, mm-hmm. So so that's where I ended up going. And it was, again, one of those incredible gifts that brings you down to your lowest points and up to your highest points of your whole existence. <laughs> um, and a beautiful community, beautiful artists, and I'm glad I went. I rambled on there. Did I answer your question? Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I, you did sort of uh, hand me the, the next question, though, which is you, you had your showcase. Did you go right into 
having representation and did you come straight to back to I mean not that Los Angeles is far from San Diego but did did that allow you to transition immediately into the work or or did you it you know did. wait tables <laughs> Oh that's funny uh <laughs> I I did. I was lucky enough to get an agent right out of graduate school. So we do our showcases again with NYU and Yale and a showcase just in case you just perform scenes and then you invite industry members to come watch you. And if they like you, they you get they get these sheets of paper with your pictures on them. Right. And they check off the people that you like. Mm -hmm. And then you have a monitor that sorts through and then they give you all the ones that checked your face. (laughs) So then. (laughs) Right. Hello. Well, they yeah, the, they the, read on yeah. your face. They like you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, nothing like they just checked your face as like <clears throat> she might do. Yeah. So then you're, you have to <laughs> call them and set up meetings. So I took some meetings in New York, but New York as a whole didn't seem to be interested in me. Hmm. Um, and so I was like, OK, cool beans. And then we go do our showcase in L.A. and I get more face checks. <laughs> so I go on. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe, you know, maybe I'm meant to be in LA mm-hmm. or, and so I go on all those meetings and then one of them stuck and it was, you know, a gr- it was mostly a female agency, which I loved. Mm-hmm. And they seemed to get what I wanted to do with my career. Of course, when you're 23, what the fuck do you know? But I thought I knew what I wanted my career yeah. to be. Um, so what, what, did, what, and what did you think you wanted your career to be at that time? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I guess it's still what I want it to be. I, I, uh, I wanted it to be strong female characters that are fighting for something. Um, you but knew that I understood at, at that point. What's that? You knew that at 23? Absolutely. That's uh, amazing. But That's because fantastic. I was doing it myself. Well, right? Because at that point, but I also threw in the mix, sorry, in the meeting. It's like a girl who wants something but can't, isn't quite ready, right? She's a little bit naive. She has something to prove. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's where I knew I was personally, and mm-hmm. I felt like I could play those women without, you know, mm-hmm. uh, right, uh, n- pretty naturally. Uh, now I've moved into the, I don't have to prove anything, I've got my shit together because I'm in my 30s, and I think, <laughs> I, th- I think I know more than I did when I was 23. Uh-huh. That's, some, that's some incredible insight, though, because yeah. we, we've talked about uh, branding, marketing, knowing yourself, acting, oh. as autobi- uh, acting as autobiographical, you know, all these sure. different ideas about... Uh, meshing the characters that you're auditioning for with who you are as a person and to have that kind of insight Mm -hmm. I mean I I, you probably would get a little bit of stabilization from going to that much schooling but that's that's pretty incredible yeah oh it's a it's a it's a definitely another level from girl next door or right you know or or another another level of specificity yes yeah yes I think that's important to to know what your gold is, to know what your natural essence mm-hmm. is. You've got to know that and start there and then you can build onto mm-hmm. the because we can play characters that are far away from ourselves, too, because otherwise you get bored. Um, but you got to know exactly where you're, st- you're starting from, I, th- I think. Yeah. Na- natural yeah. essence is a, is a fantastic way to put it. So so you you go you go straight out of well, almost straight out of grad school to Los Angeles and yeah, with right re- away. with representation right away. Yeah, so, lucky bitch. Mm-hmm. Wh- <laughs> For real. I mean, that's that's a leg up that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, that is huge. That is huge, which is why I was like, did you wait tables or what, you know, did, did you ever, yes, was there ever also. like the... Sur- okay, yeah, yes, I was going to say, not so, that agent equals never waiting tables. No, 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 exactly. <laughs> oh, so, God, um, are you kidding? The, I mean, there, who was it? Someone recently came on the podcast that did have that story that they were like, yeah, I just did whatever it took to only make money from my acting oh, career. And Dude, how'd they do that? Yeah, I know, right? I think it Crazy. Might have been Michelle. Michelle Jubilee. It may, mm-hmm. Yeah, it may have been Michelle Gonzalez. Uh, I can't remember, but someone, <clears throat> it, it was a female that mm-hmm. said, like, I just did, I just I just busted my ass and did whatever it took so that I didn't Good have for to. Her. You know, and, and worked, you know, adjacent, acting adjacent jobs. Acting job. adjacent jobs. Yeah, so so what were your, uh, we call them, by the way, Terry, we call them thrival jobs instead of survival jobs on the podcast. <laughs> so what were your thrival jobs in that in that time? Uh, well, uh, my first. <laughs> you sound <laughs> really embarrassed. What's happening right now? <laughs> well, I don't know. It won't make any sense. My name tag said plant technician. Oh. So what I did, uh, I went into very wealthy people's mansions and watered their plants. Oh, my goodness. 
because they didn't have time, energy, effort, or care to water their own plants. And these houses are enormous, and they had like, you know, 50 plants in a house. Was this so, your enterprise? No, this was through a friend who was okay. like, come along, let me help. She'd been out for a year. She's like, let me help you, honey. Because I'm not good with the, the changing the diapers, so I can't do nannying stuff. Yeah. Uh, which is another great thing that people are able to do. So, um, so you yeah. were like you were like a plant equivalent of a dog walker. For yes, like I walked the plants. Plant nanny. There's actually. An I act. dusted them. I caressed them. I t- I didn't talk to them unless I was having a bad day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You should have. There's research those that shows died. that. They, <laughs> yeah, those ones died. The ones you talked to died. Um, that's incredible. How long did you do that for? Oh, I don't like three or four years. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> I thought you were going to say weeks. Plant te- <laughs> it's funny because plant technician, uh, like at first I thought, were you like doing maintenance on a factory? Right? Like no, I, I wasn't my, thinking my, like, I like plant. biological plant. Anyway, that's hilarious. <laughs> what a, that's, it was fun. Uh, I have to say, Terry, we, yeah. have, we have had literally entire episodes uh, oh. where we talk about different thrival jobs that actors have had and we have... Um, our listeners send in crazy jobs that they've had and stuff like that. That one has never come up. Nope, that's a great one. <laughs> never. Not once has that one come up. That is fantastic. I don't fantastic. know if I should celebrate that or be mortified. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, so you have no idea how many of our listeners are now Googling how to become a plant technician. <laughs> um, sweet. So, so three or four years of, of doing plant technician. Was, were there any other thrival jobs or were you booking at this time? What, what was going on in, in, in this... Uh, in your in your tenure as a plant technician, <laughs> well, I, um, I did also work for Pete's Coffee and Tea oh. because I have a an obsession with high quality coffee and tea, and because I get bored. How and when you're first starting out, nobody knows who you are. Even if you have an agent, they don't bring you in that often. Yeah. So, and I wanted to be able to pay for casting workshops because you have to get yourself in the room. Hmm. Um, so I worked for Pete's Coffee and Tea and used it as a meet people, study people from all walks of life job, which and then uh, something to do so you don't get bored or sad waiting for the phone to ring. Hmm. So that was my other, uh, what was your question? Other jobs. <laughs> yeah, but, yes. yeah, I mean, it's other jobs and also I'm interested when like the, you know, because oh. <clears throat> I'm looking at your, your you know, right. we, we looked at your, your IMDb, of course, before we started recording and it's it's from 2008 2009 it's pretty consistent like it, it, i'm imagining that Ooh. i'm imagining that in addition to your um you know your i you know we're going to talk about your brazilian jiu jitsu and 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 all that stuff but sure. i mean in addition to your sort of other um interests like the 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 physical stuff you, uh-huh. You've been working. It looks like, anyway, pretty consistently. Now, I don't know. IMDb is. Um, You're cute. It can be. Mm-hmm. A, it can be a, a, a bit of a, a trick of the. Uh, a trick. Sure. Of, you know, a sort of marketing trick. I can't remember. Somebody, one well, guest, say- came, came yeah. on and was like, you know, you could have a giant gap in years on your IMDb and be working constantly. Mm-hmm. It's just sure. not a very good representation of someone's career. So. Um, so, or my so school first level jobs on IMDb were like one day long, so I worked sure. a day a year. <laughs> a day a year for several years. Yeah, that's yeah, so been I, that's been the but, story of my life uh, yeah. recently. So I, I get that one. <laughs> yeah, well, it, in television and film, which is we'll get to this eventually, but that's why I, I started a theater company, and so we can you know we'll get there in a sec. But the, my first couple of jobs on IMDb were from, and don't tell my old agency I said this were from casting director workshops. It had nothing to do with them. Yeah. So I, 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 would go to I these... won't tell. I won't tell okay. them. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they would say things like, we're not going to, my agency, we're not submitting you for co-star parts. We think you're better than that. Cool. That's great that you think that. I have nothing on my resume. Yeah. Yeah. I want to practice. Yep. So I'd go to these casting director workshops. Do you, do you want me to explain what those are? Or you've probably talked about them. Oh, we've talked about them a lot. Ad nauseum. Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I and, mean, not, yeah. not, not, I mean, not ad nauseum, but it's always interesting to hear people's uh, relationship to them. And yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Well, we had, when, when the, when the shit really started hitting the fan, we uh-huh. had a whole series where we had people who were both pro and con on for several episodes, like a five episode series, where uh, we had guests come on who were for them and guests come on who were against them. Vehemently um, against them. Yeah, yeah, basically both sides of the spectrum. Um, and I it was no really interesting. Either way, I just this is how I did it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's, um, so it's I, a tool. I, eventually, I would target the shows that I thought I should be on, and then I would go back to the guys that seemed to seem to respond to me until mm-hmm. somebody fucking hired me. <laughs> and there are a couple of those casting directors that were just generous, and they cared about people starting out, and they wanted to help them. Wow. So the first show I was on, um, I had half a sentence. But then I, I'd never been on set before, so I learned what it was like to be on shit, set, be in a trailer, say your line when there's 5,000 fucking people depending on you, you know, all that shit that you don't learn in theater school. Yeah. Uh, so those were my first couple of jobs. Um, That's great. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it makes me very happy to hear that, hear you say, you know, that there, were the, there were the few that, that were encouraging and, and wanted yeah. to support you. They exist. Those cast directors <laughs> do yes. exist. Yes. Yeah. They, unfortunately, the, uh, the exception is opposed to the rule, but um, at least in, in, my, in my experience. I know other people have Mine had too. different experiences, but um, yeah. No, I'm with you. Um, so have you, uh, I guess m- m- then my question becomes, have you gotten to a point where through a combination of session fees and residuals, are you making your living now uh or at least the majority of your income as an actor uh well yes and no Mm -hmm. um so i was married and then am divorced so now uh which is neither here nor there except that now i have to think long term if i'm going to be by myself and supporting myself for the rest of my life right Mm -hmm. i gotta go oh retirement so the couple of larger jobs that I booked, I have now just taken that money and invested it. So I have a future because you never know if you're going to book an acting job ever, ever again. You just right. don't know. Yeah. Right. So I, I had to. You know, that's a reality. Um, and so that's where. My, so now my day to day expenses, I actually choose to pay via personal training. Uh, because I love it, it's fun, and I, again, I don't get bored waiting for the phone to ring. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I do my acting jobs now. They give me my health insurance. They uh, give me my if, if I want to eat out one night a week because it feels good, I can. You know, so acting is definitely. I could live on it. I just choose not to. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to be. Yeah, I don't want to be dependent on it. I don't want it, it to be the thing that I need. I want it to be the thing that is a gift because then yeah. it can remain an art. And not everybody gets to do that, but the, I am able, lucky enough, I'm lucky enough to be able to call it my want, not my need. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. No, it's yeah. super smart. I, I have always uh, thought to myself and actually said out loud to um, friends, family, coworkers that, you know, if things start to pick up and I'm booking more often, you're still going to see me at work. Like I'm still going to be showing yeah. up at work yeah. e- every day that I'm not on set because – you know, um, nothing's like you said. Nothing's yeah. guaranteed. And it's a really unstable business. You know, and we derive personal value from work, and we yes. learn about people and life by being at work. Yes, which yes. is important yeah. as an artist. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I think yeah. it it goes a long way to keeping you grounded and connected to the real world. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. We so Terry, you probably don't know this, but we have actually had. Um, Oh, a few sort of per- personal fitness uh, guru types on the on the show before, including um, Tony Horton, the uh, the P ninety X guy. So uh, and 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 Trevor, uh, my co host, is um, he's he's a beast. Like the guy is he works out. His goal for uh, yeah, his goal every year is three hundred and sixty workouts yeah. a year. So. The guy's a beast. Oh. <clears throat> so I did want to say he bench presses three hundred and sixty pounds. <laughs> I was like, what? probably. Uh, no, not 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 that crazy. But I mean, he he he's just he's very into fitness, very into nutrition. He's actually a vegan, um, and so that whole you know aspect of the podcast, we talk about that kind of stuff a lot. So I was actually really interested in asking about your using the the personal fitness or the uh, or the personal training thing as your as a as another thrival job or thrival income and <laughs> and how you sort of balance the the, the two are you um uh, ha, has it come to pass that you've taken another actor from set and been like hey by the way I do this and then they they train with you like where are your clients coming from are you working at a gym <laughs> what what is that whole aspect of your life and career like uh I- I keep them pretty separate. I mean, you always get into conversations with people on set, but um, I call it my other life. 
So yeah. there's mm. there's a separation there. Mm. Um, you, and I don't that know. That's purposeful? not a recommendation. Yeah, it is, and it's an instinct. I don't have a why. Okay. Um, mm. But I think because when I'm in my actor pants, I want to be. In, <laughs> I want to be in my actor it, again because it takes all of you, right? So you're. If I'm thinking about like reps and sets and building my business at the same time I'm trying to build a character, my brain would explode. Right. Uh, so yeah, I keep them separate. Um, as much as I can. So I, t- I, w- I got my certification, which uh, makes me able to work kind of anywhere in LA. And there's always, I mean, it's LA. So personal trainers are needed everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I um, found another acting buddy that had a studio that he loved and they brought me on to be a teacher. Um, so some of those guys love the way I teach and they're like, Hey, do you do personal training? I'm like, Hey, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of it, a lot of it's, uh, my friends, you know, I have actor friends that want to get in shape because it's unfortunately part of our business, but also, uh, and so they ask me, you know, for sessions and I'm able to give them discounts and friends and family things so they can actually afford it. Uh, which has also become sort of something I love to be able to do is, do cheaper sessions for people that aren't, you know, don't live that fancy LA lifestyle. Hmm. Um, so am I, I'm still rambling on your question. Your yeah. question. Every time you say I'm rambling on, you're actually legitimately answering yes. uh, the question. Oh, um, that's good. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's great. Um, awesome. Uh, oh, so yeah. go so ahead. I get clients, you know, I get clients th- through referrals, through teaching, through this thing called thumbtack, yes. which if you're, yeah, mm-hmm. which is you know, great. And so that and Thumbtack is fun because then you meet people that you've never met in your entire life and you learn about what it's like to be an electrical engineer and want to work out or mm-hmm. be a paralegal and want, you know, like, what's that life like? Mm. And yes. the cool thing about personal one on one training is people are um, movement. Physicality is very connected to our emotions and exercise is can be a really intimate thing. It's a scary thing for people. There's emotional stuff wrapped up around it all the you know all over it yes so you kind of become each other's like therapist not not in an unhealthy way but you get intimate yeah with these people and which i love because as a an artist that's that's fantastic stuff and then you get yeah and then you have you form really deep relationships with people which is a good life gift Hmm. end of ramble (laughs) (laughs) end rant um end rant that's that's great. I love, I don't think, I mean, I, I because of conversations that Jasmine and I have often, uh, I am well aware of the sort of m- emotional, physical connection, but I, yeah. I never really thought about the personal training thing being a, a, a sort of a window into learning uh, not only about them, but about your relationship with them or with other people. That's, that's really interesting. It's- it was a fun discovery to make. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know if this is relevant, but I'm going to share it because it's important to me. I actually came to personal training because I was unhealthy mentally uh, about my physical appearance, um, partly, mostly <laughs> because of feedback I'd gotten from the industry that I took on. Uh, you need to lose five or 10 pounds in order to book the roles that you need to book. I got that sentence said to me. And so then I went in this di- downward spiral where working out became a punishment and I loathed my body and was thinking about it all the time. And it was awful and, you know, horrifying. And then I thought, gosh, this is a terrible way to spend my mental energy. And so I wanted to get healthy about it. And so that's why I went originally to get my certification in training so I could learn the healthy way um, to work out and the healthy way to eat. And so now it's, so it was a gift, a personal gift that now I can give to other people, but it started out as sort of a a selfish health, uh, self healing uh, thing. So there's a a confession for your podcast. Everybody, welcome back. 
hope you enjoyed part one of AJ's chat with Terry. Uh, as of this recording, I am still in the dark on this interview. I have not listened to it. But by the time you guys listen to this, I probably will have listened to it. And I will be joining you in celebrating the awesomeness that is part one of AJ's <laughs> the chat The revelry. I will be joining you in the yeah. revelry. Uh, yeah, it was it was a fun one. She's, like I said, really uh, down to earth, very, you know, uh, practical approach to her career. Uh, I love, she says, I think twice in the interview, she just s- says something akin to, I just kept showing up until somebody fucking hired me, you know, and like that, I mean, that's, what else are we doing, right? What, like, literally, what else are we doing with our career? We we, we show up, we, we get our materials together, we do our work, we try to get better as artists, and, and, and we just keep showing up until somebody fucking hires us, right? So, anyway, I, I just love that whole philosophy, just continuing to plug away at it. And, um, you know, as, as you heard, she has uh, some, some interesting sort of getting started stories with the casting director workshop. So, those come up again. So, uh, anyway, um, really excited. And, and more stuff about the, um, the work you know she's she's really known for a particular a couple of particular roles so we talk about that um all coming up in in part two so uh stay tuned for that um what is your pick of the week sir so uh this just came out in theaters but i saw an early cut of it a few months ago and it is uh nothing less than the documentary an inconvenient sequel which is the sequel to An Inconvenient Truth, which came out 10 years ago, I believe, this year in theaters. And um, if you're unfamiliar, we have some younger listeners, so if you're unfamiliar, uh, An hmm. Inconvenient Truth was a film that really brought the the um, climate change movement into the mainstream. Like, it really made it a, a more sort of conscious issue, a, a larger issue in the public consciousness. And that was a huge deal, a really huge deal. And uh, that was a great film that still totally holds its own. An Inconvenient Sequel is, in my opinion, even better, not only because it's updated, but because the message has been refined. The science is so much deeper now. And the urgency and the advancements, frankly, as well, are also so much more like further along. Uh, we were talking before we started recording, AJ, and um, we were talking about sort of like, you know, what the film does and what it is. And, and I, I have to say that few people inspire hope the way Al Gore does. And a lot of the footage actually in the film is from the same training that I was at in Miami in 2015. So I can actually see there's a, there was one time in the training uh, where he was late to the, to the day. I think it was the second day he was, he was late to, to, the, to start the, the trainings. We were all like all thousand of us were like waiting around. Um, but he finally came in and he was like, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was out, uh, with the mayor, uh, and we were, we were uh, just exploring some of the, the parts of the city that regularly flood. They call it sunny day flooding. That's a very nice way of saying, you know, ocean level rise. And, uh, and he said, and it flooded so much higher than we expected that, uh, it went over my boots and it, it just completely drenched my, my pants, my trousers. So I had to go back to my hotel and change real fast. And that whole scene is in the movie. So, like, there's footage from, like, when we were waiting <laughs> in the movie of what was actually happening. Like behind, it's like uh, behind the scenes of your life. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool, man. And the movie, you know, it's great. Like, he, he I, just, I don't know how he does it, man. He really spins a really hopeful, positive message. And you leave the theater really believing that we can do this, that people care. that that we're on the right path and that things are going to turn around. And I need that kind of thing, man. I had to really remove myself from this conversation uh, after I I did attended that training um, because just the more I learn about climate change and the destruction of the natural world and the shift of biomass from wildlife to human beings, it's just, it's so, uh, it's so unbelievably depressing. It's just like, it's, it was hard for me to find good news and it was starting to really mess with my, my level of happiness. And so I had to sort of block it out and, and, and start to pretend that it wasn't happening a little bit. Mm. Um, so that, that, you know, that's a tough thing. And it's a very real thing. I forget the actual term for it, but it's something like eco depression or climate depression or climate despair. And it's a very common thing among activists. They just get like, they literally develop clinical depression because, the news is so bad and so overwhelming and the inertia to make the necessary changes is, is so strong. 
uh, and I was talking with you before we started recording that I was just reading this study this morning that just came out. Uh, and I've known this for a while, uh, but now it's like in the headlines and I kind of wish it wasn't because we don't need more people throwing their hands up and saying, well, what the hell are we supposed to do about it anyway? But this study that now says uh, that uh, basically we are locked in to two degrees of Celsius, two degrees Celsius of, of planetary warming, uh, no matter what we do. Like even if humans stopped emitting all greenhouse gases today, we just stopped. We just vanished. Uh, the planet would continue to warm over the next 20 to 40 years because there's a it's a it's a it's like a delayed effect. The the the, the crap that we put into the atmosphere decades and decades ago has yet to manifest itself and so that was sort of like a oh well shit you know like yeah but that doesn't mean um that i think that we should just go oh well screw it i'll just buy a hummer you know i'll just keep eating my you know two pound steaks every night like it doesn't mean that we should just give up on it i think it means I think it means to underscore just how urgent this is and just how vital every single voice is in this fight and every single person doing, even if it's a small thing, a, a tiny thing makes a big difference because it can add up and your friends will see you making that a priority in your life and it will make a big difference. So please go see the film. Please uh, consider making some, some lifestyle changes, being a part of this fight, being a part of this, this movement because we're, we have to make the transition to a clean energy economy, and that's going to in, involve so many lifestyle changes and so many things done differently that are going to feel like sacrifices at first, but in the long run are actually going to be big lifestyle enhancers, I think. So, yeah, please go see the film. It's in theaters right now. You can find the link to the website on our website. It's actually a Tumblr website. It's inconvenientsequel.tumblr.com. Um, where you can see the trailer, you can see clips, you can learn about actions you can take. Um, and if you do see it or you would like to talk about this at all, you guys know where to find me. I would love to chat with anybody and everybody about this and just have the conversation and brainstorm ways to be a force for good in this movement mm. and really get us where we need to go because I don't need more bad news in my life. I need <laughs> good news. And this is a, a, a cause that is very near and dear to my heart. It's the future of the planet and all life on it. And that's a big sweeping statement, I know. But I hope but a truthful that, one. I, and I hope that when you see the film, you'll agree. Yes, this is the most urgent issue facing mankind. Not just mankind. Screw mankind. I mean, all life on the planet. Why do we always make it about us? There's... There's a lot of other life forms uh, whose well-being is at stake, and I think we have a responsibility to, to be good stewards. So, uh, yeah, please see the film and contact me. I would love to, to team up with you, um, whoever you are, wherever you are uh, in this in this fight. I'm done. I love it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I I can't believe it's been 10 years, first of all. Yeah. Uh, this film was my... I mean, the first film was my introduction, as you said, to, you know, the, the, the reality of climate change. And, you know, I knew it was a thing and I did my best to reduce my carbon footprint, but I, I, it, you know, this film just, you know, rocked me and, and, um, has kept me, uh, you know, as conscious as possible ever since. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's crazy. It's been 10 years, which means it, it it did come out the same year as the original iPhone. And you said before we started recording, hey, you know, the iPhone changed the world in less than five years. Like, who knows what technology might support us in this fight. And um, I was just thinking, you know, uh, Elon Musk just two days ago or whatever it was announced the or, re you know, revealed the uh, uh, Tesla Model 3. And, um, you know, he's he's doing all kinds of stuff to try and get us onto some more sustainable energy sources. And, um, you know, we, we, like you said, we just need more people like Al Gore, uh, like Elon, um, like more companies like Apple that are, um, just crushing it in terms of, um, using renewable and sustainable energy. Have you, do you know about, um, Apple's, uh, new commitment, by the way, to stop mining? Uh, I heard just sort of about it peripherally. What what do they do? So I can't remember what the date is. It's something like twenty 
2030 or something, 2025 or something like that, they are aiming to stop all mining, period. Like no longer make their goods from taking resources from the planet. Period. Oh, they'll just be recycling all their existing exactly. products. Exactly. Love yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, can you imagine, like, what, 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 what would it be like if Bed Bath & Beyond decided to do something like that? Like, this, this mecca of, like, plastic. This giant room where we store plastic in different shapes and sizes to meet our, you know, convenience needs. If a company like that were to take steps uh, like Apple is taking right now, I can't. I can't even imagine. So, um, yeah. you know, like you said, there is there is hope. It may be um, it may be a, a, a very very slim slice of pie, but but uh, but there is hope. So uh, thanks for that. I'm really excited to see this. Um, you've had this on our outline for a while because you knew what the release date was. So I've been uh, I've been very much <laughs> looking forward to it for a while. Yeah, it's excellent. And, you know, I just want to say one more thing, and that's, that is that what we need here are leaders. I think most people are aware of this issue, believe it's a really important issue, believe in the validity of the science, and want to change, but they don't really know what to do or how to do it. And it's just one more thing on their to-do list that they just kind of keep putting off. And so what we need are people to start living that ideal in any way they can, even if it's one tiny thing a day, just start doing it, start adapting it, start figuring out how to build it into your life. And your friends and family will see that and their friends and family will see them doing it. And it just spreads like that. And we just need examples like Apple, like Elon Musk, like like Tesla. I mean, they're doing huge things. But but all of us, if we can all show up as a leader in this movement in one tiny way, that's how it starts. And uh, and we need to we need to be doing that. So Please, please do that. <laughs> please do that. <laughs> please do that. Please do that. Continually educate yourself and 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 slowly move toward uh, living with your values. That's that's my my parting wisdom there. Are you are you are you <laughs> fading back into non-existence now? <laughs> yeah. My goodbye. Make a bye. Uh, no. <laughs> doc. Doc. <laughs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> So my so pick of the week is is not nearly as world changing, uh, but uh, but maybe for one one person it's a combination my pick and and probably a listener pick although he doesn't know that I'm doing this but long time uh, listener and supporter of the podcast Kevin Johnson Kevin L Johnson on uh, IMDb and and therefore probably his union status um, <clears throat> has uh, been in communication with us lately because he was really excited that he had booked his biggest job thus far, a recurring role on the streaming Netflix show uh, Ozark. And uh, he's been chatting to us uh, through uh, Facebook, I believe. And I was really excited for him and always really excited to celebrate the wins of any of our uh, listeners, so I probably would have talked about this at some point anyway, but I binged the first uh, four or five episodes, so like sort of the first half of the season, because I think it's kind of a, one of those shorter um, uh, seasons that some of the streaming shows are doing, and it's really good, and he's fantastic in it. He has this really quirky, fun role. Um, he gets to work uh, directly with <laughs> Laura Linney in the, in the scenes that I saw anyway, and I was just like, so jealous because I think she's a fantastic actor and um, just really cool uh, win for for one of our listeners and we've always you know appreciated the the support of listeners like Kevin and uh, I would just encourage everyone to to check it out I, I know you've probably seen um, advertisements for it around I, I've been seeing billboards around here in Los Angeles for quite a while and and had no idea and when you look at the billboards it's like what is this about um because they did they the the imagery that they use is very mysterious um and so i i started watching it and one of the best ways i could think to describe it <clears throat> is if breaking bad had started where sky already knew that's kind of like the the ballpark that this this lives in um so uh check it out ozark on netflix it's it's a really fantastic show Badass. All right, I'll add that to my list for when I re re plug into the, the internet vault. To the Matrix. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and congrats, Kevin. That's really, really cool. I've, I've, 
I've seen the messages. Have you met him? In person, you, I don't. Do you know him personally? I don't. Be, no, okay. I, I don't believe we've met in person. But uh, but he's been, uh, like I said, a long time uh, listener and supporter of the podcast. So want to celebrate you too as well, buddy. So congratulations again, Kevin. Very cool. So that is Very cool. Um, an inconvenient sequel, which was just released in theaters this week. Go and check that out, and then uh, change the world and Ozark. Go and check that out and support one of our uh, longtime listeners. Badass, man. Badass. All right. Anything else before we boogie? Nah, brother. Let's boogie. All right. Today's episode of Inside Acting was produced and hosted by me, Trevor Algott, and AJ Meyer. Jen Levin is our production coordinator. Gadella Gubrek is our marketing and web director. Deborah Smith is our community manager. Grace Gordon is our director of public relations. And Berlin designed our logo. AJ Meyer edited and mixed today's episode. And uh, me, Trevor Algott, composed our theme and interview today. I was like, I'm a composer, Mom. Uh, You can sign up for our weekly email dispatch and listen to all of our episodes at our website, InsideActing.net. You can also find us on social media and wherever you get your podcasts. If you've got a minute, please leave us a review on iTunes, the world's largest podcast aggregator, because that really helps us out a lot. Big thanks to our sponsors, Rehearsal Pro and VO2GoGo.com. And a big thanks to you guys. Our listeners, you guys make this thing happen every single week. Visit our website to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, like we just said. Uh, get links to our to, to everything we talked about in this episode. And if you'd like, you can support the continued production of the show with either a one-time financial contribution or an ongoing contribution as part of our membership each month. Just visit us, visit us at InsideActing.net to learn more about how to do that and to show us uh, some very useful, important, essential love. (laughs) We need love. It is essential. (laughs) That is is it for episode 285 of Inside Acting. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, be a leader. Be a leader.